if you'll open your Bibles to John, the, tw uh, the eighth chapter of John, we're in a study called Truly, Truly, I Say Unto You. And John records a new teaching technique that Jesus used of, he, uh, in the English it's truly, truly I say to you, but it's actually the word truly, truly are the Hebrew words, amen. He actually says, amen, amen, I say to you. Now we've talked a great deal about the amen of the Old Testament, but I recorded for you, and when you want to get a good look of how it was used in the Old Testament, it was used for doxology or great doctrinal principles that were important to the generation to, be, to hear it, or the dispensation, like the Jewish age. So I, I put it down on your paper again because it's a classic example of how it was used in the Old Testament so that you can see how it became a new te teaching technique in the New Testament as John records it in the book of John. When you look at Deuteronomy 27, and I, I recorded uh, 14 through 26, it was a recital within a congregation. <clears throat> the priest would, would say one line, the people would, would return with an amen. And... Here's what the amen means to you. And that show, and so it was always at the end. What Jesus did, he doubled it up and put it at the beginning of a great messianic doctrine. And John, John caught that. And John records 11 of them in 21 chapters. John records 11 of them. And I, I listed the chapters that you can read truly, truly, I say unto you. Um, he's the only one that records it uh, to that extent. And therefore, when you're reading truly, truly, you're always looking for key messianic doctrines that Jesus was teaching, trying to get the Israelites to understand why God sent him into the world and why he sent them into Jerusalem uh, or into the nation of Israel. There were a lot of nations, right, that he could have sent them to, but he sent them to Israel because of the prophetic background of why the promised land, why the promised people, yada, yada. So John records this, and John records uh, all of these. Now, what is interesting is that, you, for example, in John, the eighth chapter, where, where we're going to be, you know, I said we, we found him in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 6. Now I'm in chapter 8. In chapter 8, he actually gives us three. Three truly trulys. Now, we've seen him do that before, where he backs them up, and he goes, truly, truly, and that's going to lead you to a second one and a third one. And so I listed those for you that would be important for you. For example, there's, if you've got your Bibles open to John 8, verse 34, say, truly, truly, I say to you. Look down at verse 51. Truly, truly, I say unto you. Look down at verse 58 when he's winding up this section. You notice that? There's 59 verses in the chapter, right? Okay. I just thought maybe I had one more than you. Uh, then he closes out with a truly, truly in 58, right? Now, every time you see that truly, truly, you want to really pay attention because there's a messianic doctrine in there. And often the Jews would miss that because they were, they were key doctrines for the church, and the church was a mystery. So sometimes they were veiled in their ignorance, right? Uh, or not having been exposed to the idea that, but what they were to get from it were, was that the Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah, and he spoke something. And when he was speaking, oftentimes in these messianic doctrines, were, were doctrines that were connected to the mystery or the church. So there's sometimes a, a, a message in there. Well, Fran, good to see you. Okay. I, I, I saw Dennis, I looked around, and I thought, well... Dennis has come. Thank goodness for Dennis. And then I saw Fran. So we're glad to have you back, guys. Well, 
Let me have a word of prayer so I can get back to my train of thought. Okay? Let me get back to my train of thought. Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest, and this classroom etiquette is true for those who are with me on the Internet today. You need to pause whatever you're doing. Uh, close down distractions in your life or in your home or wherever you are. And get alone with God. And etiquette for classroom is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in church age. Every believer is indwelt, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20. And the Holy Spirit is where great divine revelation comes to you, and both in the learning and in the living of it. Uh, the indwelling teaches you, and the indwelling walks, walks that word of God right out of your life, right out in the, in the ev average, everyday activity of your life. But in order for you to be spiritual and carnal, you've got to confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And this puts you in under the ministry operation of the word of God, both in learning and living, and that's a key. So I give you a moment of your priesthood, 1 Peter 2, in your priesthood to make confessions necessary. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. That's an extension from the work of the cross to the Christian life. Uh, in sanctification, in other words, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins, but they should be identified and confessed before study. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for each person that's come our way, both by automobile and by internet, to study with us the truth of the Word of God. We're going to open the Scriptures and look at the truly trulys out of the Gospel of John and look at the Messianic teachings that we might see the, the revelation of the incarnation of Christ and it's important in human history. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? Next verse, to redeem the world. He came as a lamb of God who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God as a grace gift by the propitious work of Christ. We as Christians ought to be able to bring that to the Word of God for our study and for the application of that Word of God into our life. We are the light of Christ to the world. May we be that kind of a people today as we look at this great temple discourse where we see many of the doctrines of truly, truly being taught. In Jesus' name, amen. What is interesting about when we get to the chapter 8 is that we're in what's called the temple discourse. It occurs, and I'll talk about it in a moment. This is the temple discourse. The temple discourse, I wrote it on your paper. Look up here at point one, and you'll see that the temple discourse began in the, tenth, in the seventh chapter, verse 10, and is going to go through the tenth chapter, verse 21. It's called the temple discourse. Now, if you have a study Bible like a Ryrie, a good Ryrie study Bible? Ryrie will point these out to you. He will, he will show you either in his introduction or somewhere in this textual context. He will tell you, he will list. I think maybe, if I remember right, it was in the introduction, Don. I, maybe in the introduction. I think probably in the introduction when he's going through talking about what's important to look for in, as you study the Gospel of John under Ryrie, uh, I highly recommend his study Bible. It's excellent. But he's going to list the five discourses. He, I think he calls them debates because Jesus is going to say something and the Jews are going to respond. And so he calls them debate. We, theologically, we call them discourses because we're looking to what Jesus said, not to how they responded. But I think the re he calls them, if I remember right, he calls them a debate because there's a statement and then a response every time, all through the five discourses. So we, they're known to us as the temple discourse. You've probably heard that phrase, right? You've heard that about the temple discourse. Well, there are five of them. Now, why that, this temple discourse is important to us is because when I listed for you where the truly trulys are taught by Jesus and recorded by John, right? Remember, I, I listed them up there at the top of your paper. Look, 
There's one in, listen, they're recorded in chapter 8, that's part of temple discourse, and chapter 10, part of temple discourse, right? Yeah. In this temple discourse, and we got three of them in the 8th chapter. Now, what is going to be important before I get to, get to this truly, truly in chapter 8, and there are three of them, agreed? Then there are going to be a couple more in John in this temple discourse. In order for me to do this, you have to understand that by now, you know, we should, we've studied all these up to now, that the one thing Jesus was was quick on his feet. Right? We saw that last week when he talked about the bread. I mean, he didn't start talking about the bread. They made an assumption about manna, and then the all the other ones were off from that. He took where they were and taught them the word of God. I guess that would be good for all of us to do that. And in truth, we do that in human experience. When we're talking to somebody, we're thinking, how can I talk about Christ? And, and, and we find a reason, oh, water. Well, I remember he talked to the woman, oh, food. Oh, it, you know, I mean, there's just about any kind, hello, just about, I don't know if that was from in-house or up-house. <laughs> so things always bother me. I don't know if John's playing with me or if the Lord's playing with me. Is your life go like that? We got great poker players. They all shook their head. No, that's just <laughs> that's just your weirdness, Ron. Okay, I I'll take that. Uh, so there's a background. So he's always on his feet. He's always thinking. He's always saying, how can I relate to the people the truth of God's word? We all do that, don't we? Come on now, we all do that. So the background to the temple discourse is very important because he's going to give of five truly truly's in the temple discourse. And he's going to try to relate to the people that are there. Now the, the so let's go let's go to the seventh chapter for a moment. Because I've had prayer, so we're ready. Now you remember you, you remember truly Amen and all that business. Here we are in the seventh chapter where this this thing this thing is going to begin. All right, in the seventh chapter. Um Look at verse 2, 7th chapter, verse 2. Here's the background. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of Booth, which is tabernacles. We're at the feast of tabernacles. Are you with me? By the way, I'm at point one. <laughs> if somebody wants, if anybody's following me at this point, I'm at point one. All right? At point one. Now, here, here's that temple discourse. Now, here's what's important about the Feast of Tabernacles, or what's called booths. It's recorded in Leviticus 23. All right? It's one of three national holidays that you were required to attend if, if you were Orthodox, if, if you were a true believer uh, in the, the Jewish business, Right? You, they were three. You, you, you had Passover, you know, you know the three, the, the three of the group. Yet three national holidays. And this one, if you want to study, and at some point you should, you would want to study, and I wrote the scriptures, Leviticus 23, 33 through 44. It will tell you, it will lay out this holiday. This is a, a and, uh, and why, it, why they celebrated it and when they celebrated it. All right? That's really important to us because when we know what we know, when they just say it was at the Feast of the Tabernacles, when we go to Leviticus, we know the month, we know the days. They assume when you read the seventh chapter of John, verse 2, that you knew this. They just say in verse 2, now the Feast of the Jews, the Feast of Booth, was at hand. Okay? We know that, that we know the month. This is the seventh month of the Jewish year. We know that this is going to occur from the 15th to the 22nd. It actually 
even though it's called the seven-day festival, it actually occurs eight. But, you see, if you, how would you know that? Well, you'd have to go back and look it up. So, being the wonderful pastor to you that I am, I looked it up for you because you pay my salary. So, you know, this is a help. I help you, you help me, and we're both happy. Right? So I recorded this so that you could read and know that when I say this is the seventh month of the Jewish year, this is going to occur between 15 and, and 22, that where I found it. Right? Now, if I was smart, I wouldn't tell you that. I'd make you know that I'm smart. But you see, we all are smart if we have a Bible. If we have a Bible, we can look all this stuff up. If you have a good Ryrie Bible, they probably told you to, at that, in verse 2, probably told you to look up uh, 23, Leviticus 23 and the passage, right, Ernie? Ernie says, yeah. Oh, Ernie says, no, I'm, I'm not committing until I look it up. <laughs> I love that. There's a soldier of the Lord and not Ron Adama. Love that. Well, anyhow, this is where we are. It's about to come into being. It's about to come into being. Now, there's another, another passage I gave you that, that would be important for you to look at, not now, but would be important you look at on your own time. This is my time. Would be Deuteronomy. Now, I put verse 16 and 17, but you would really want to look at the whole passage. Write this down, because I know you're good students. And if, you, and, if, and if you didn't miss it, don't raise your hand and ask me what it was. See Ernie. Ernie's my go-to guy. So this is going to be Deuteronomy 16, verses 13 through 21 is what you really want to read. I just focus in on 16, 17. Here's what they tell you. Leviticus doesn't. What Deuteronomy is going to tell you about it, and you know, when you're deal dealing with Leviticus, you're dealing with Deuteronomy. You do know that. These are sister books, kind of like Colossians, Ephesians. Mm hmm Okay. Well, here's the, and this is a wonderful thing, and I'll show you how bad the Jews were. This is important. Listen to what they say. Listen, the, the Feast of the Booth, the Feast of Tabernacle, is supposed to be a joyful occasion because of the blessings of God. <laughs> this is supposed to be a, a joyful occasion of the blessings of God. See, it was to celebrate the exodus and, and headed to the promised land because God had delivered them and God was going to take care of them. And we got booths in the wilderness. Uh, we're stopping over. We're, we're not staying. We're just going to put up a little booth. We're not staying. We're going to the promised land. Where are you going, buddy? I'm going to the promised land. Where are you going? We're going to the promised land. We know what time it was of the year. We know what time it was of the year. It's the seventh month. We know how long they stayed, 15 through 22. Whoa! You understand that? That's how important the Word of God is. That's how important the background of this is. Okay. Now, you're going to get that information out of Deuteronomy talking about this holiday. And then he's going to say that this is a celebration of the blessings of life that come from God. Man, we ought to live in a booth, shouldn't we? Uh, the Christian church, the Christian church, listen, our feet hit the floor, our heart ought to hit heaven. When your feet hit the floor, your heart ought to hit heaven and say, Joyce, and we glad this is the day the Lord has made. Instead of, oh, I say, my <laughs> Right? Listen, we, we live in the fulfillment of this. We live. Be joyful. Consider it all. Consider it all. <laughs> Not some. And that, listen, this is because Jesus, Jesus, listen, he brought all this into that, into force in our life. We don't have to have 
the seventh month to do it and eight days. Listen, we have it every day. I mean, we walk in the joy of the Lord. We walk in the joy of the Lord. Do we? I'm not just asking. My, listen, when your feet hit the floor, let your heart hit heaven. There's, your, there's where your day will be. Wherever your feet go, your heart's already been. There'll be no surprises for that day. None. Well, well worth your time to take a look at Deuteronomy 16, I think. It would be well worth your time. And another thing that Deuteronomy tells you, that out of this joyful attitude should come an attitude about bringing a gift to God. And it should be something that is proportioned to the blessings, your concept of the blessings. Now, I don't know that he would require your dog. I don't know what that gift, you know. I'm not sure he'd say, well, what you get. It's, you know, it's not to bribe God. It, it's, uh, it's an honor system that comes out of a heart that has been blessed. And he says, well, it, during this time, bring, bring him something. And, and he gives you an idea. And what is that about? It's an appreciation of grace. It's not priming the pump. You, you, are you old school? If I say prime the pump, do you know what I'm talking about? Nah, forget it. Jeez. I don't have any modern day illustrations, apparently. Oh, mine come out of a dark part of my world. I <laughs> we used to prime pump to get water, people. All right. The f Listen, here's another part of this important because this is this is the this is the historical part. Th listen to me now. This is I'm about to give you because listen, the Feast of Tabernacles is to celebrate the second coming of Christ. Here's how it's connected because of Christ's first coming. You don't have a if you don't have a first, you don't have a second. There are two days that are so important in this festival that celebrates the second coming of Christ. For the church, we know that there's a second coming. The Jew, when this was given, they didn't know there was a second coming because the church was a mystery that sat in between them, between the first coming and second coming. Now you know this. We've talked about this till the cows come home. You do know when cows come home. That's apparently not... Well, let me tell you where the Christ in the tabernacle is before Christ comes for the tabernacle business, okay? Listen to me now. The first day and the last day. Now, remember, the tabernacles, it, it operates on dates, not days. Agreed? We, it's a, always the 15th through the 22nd. Now, well, listen to me. The f first day and the last day are high Sabbaths. Oh, please tell me, you know who, who fulfilled the Sabbath business, right? Mark 2.27. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the what? Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. So the first day and the last day is all about the first coming of Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of that in order to bring the total business together in the tabernacle of the second coming. In other words, the tabernacle business, the whole idea of the tabernacle is for the millennial age. The millennial age, according to Zechariah. Okay? I've got it listed somewhere. See, I hope that I'm coaching you up on Jewish holidays. F there are seven of them. Four of them deal, the first four, the four of them deal with the first coming and the last deal with the second coming. When you're dealing with the second coming of them, listen to me now. This is, this is why you pay me. When you're looking at those second coming ones, you're looking at, listen, pay attention to the Sabbath holidays. Right? That connects that to the first coming of Christ. 
He, is, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, he healed on Sabbath and went, boo, boo. He said, man, I healed this man. It's been blind for, boo, boo. Why are you booing me? Because you did it on the Sabbath. Well, you dummy. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, anyhow, I, I don't know that he said dummy, but <laughs> he might have thought it, but I don't know that he said it. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to get in trouble, Lord. So, there are three of the seven holidays that are connected with the second coming of Christ in the millennial age, and they would, they would fall under place. I wrote them down, the trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Okay? The Feast of Tabernacle was an interesting holiday, like the other three are. When you have the three that are connected with the second coming of Christ, they always look backwards and always look forwards based on who Jesus Christ is. The coming of Jesus Christ makes this important to the past and makes it important to the future. Isn't that true in your life? I mean, what made your life have a, have a past that has been victoriously conquered by the person of Jesus Christ and in that you have everything to look forward to? Is that, that only happened to me? Okay. I'll take it. So the Feast of Tabernacles, it looked back to the Exodus, the wonderful blessings of God that took them out of slavery. It looked back to that. And it looked forward to the Millennial Kingdom. Okay? Zechariah. When you read Zechariah 14 on your own time, when you read Zechariah 16, well, you want to go, when you get into, when you get into 14, you actually want to go back to about verse 13. And you want to run that to verse 21. I think I just gave you 16 through 21. I want you to increase that to 13 because there's a phrase that's used that's very, very important. And you can see it in the English. In Zechariah 14, let me write, I, I've got a thing I've got to write here for Ron. 14, verses 13 through 21. Watch, write this down in your paper because you want to go back and you go like, I forgot what he said. So write this down on that day. On that day. Write that down. If, if you want to study it, if you don't want to study it, there's no reason to do that. But there's a phrase that's used three times. Now we're talking about the Feast of Tabernacles into the Millennial Kingdom. And there's a phrase, and on that day, now you know what he's talking about. It's used three times. Don't look it now. Look it up later. Listen, what, do you, what else are you going to do this afternoon? I, I don't want to know. But somewhere, you know, catch it. At the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, religious Jews were already... Listen, <laughs> I, you know, you could have a strange view of a joyful... A joyful idea. You know what theirs was? The religious Jews' idea of a joyful, this would make the tabernacle, the best tabernacle ever we've celebrated if we could kill Jesus. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the absolute, I am not, I mean, this is just staggering in my heart. It's just, at the beginning of the feast, the religious Jews were already plotting to assassinate Jesus in John, the seventh chapter, in the first nine verses. And they knew this is a joyful holiday. It shows you how twisted your mind can become when you ignore the truth of the word of God. You understand that? What a joy. This will be the best festival ever if we could just kill that sucker. You go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought this was, well, it'll be joyful when we kill him. And listen. Jesus is going to bring that to their attention. You know what else occurred during this festival? The eighth chapter and the first 11 verses, you know what it's about? It's about a woman, these crumbs, caught in the, they trapped, they didn't catch her, they trapped her in adultery to bring legal charges against Jesus so that they could get the government to do their dirty work. That's evil. 
I don't care if it's the United States or Israel. That's evil. I don't care if that's the United States or the state of Alabama. That's evil. They used her. Seventh chapter, I'm plotting to kill Jesus. Cowards, how can we do it? We'll do it legally. We'll get the government to do the work of evil. You understand that? See, the seventh chapter opens with let's kill Jesus. The eighth chapter opens, let's do it legally. Not honorably, legally. And they finally do it by destroying a perfect law. By having cowards come and talk pre prejudiced against the law and Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus, and listen, his family were like a lot of families. <laughs> Maybe it'd be better not to listen to their advice. Their advice was, we ought to go because this would be a good day to get our name out. We got all these people coming in. Let's go pass cards out and tell them Jesus is in town. <laughs> Jesus knows that they're, that they're going to try to kill him. That's all in the seventh chapter if you're interested in reading it. So, verse 14, seventh chapter, verse 14 is very interesting because in the 14th chapter, he didn't take the vice of his of his kin people until the middle of the week. Now watch it. Now we know what middle of the week is, right? We're talking about 15 to 22. In the, but when it was in the midst of the feast, the middle of the feast week, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. You with me? Yeah? All right. Look at the 8th chapter for a moment. I'm just trying to get you... I'm trying to get you oriented to where all this is going on and when it's going on. Look at verse 8th chapter, look at verse 20. We even know where in the temple he was teaching, in the temple discourse. In the, in the treasury chamber. <laughs> in the, we know it was in the treasure chamber of the temple. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Do you understand that? Do you know that's the hedge around your life in the angelic conflict? Job had it, Jesus has it, you have it. And, when, and listen, when anything is permitted into your... You know, whenever, whenever God turns off the electricity that's around you, you know, and lets somebody in, it's because it's a gr glorious day for your life. It's a day for you to draw the sword and fight by faith for the kingdom. You do know that, don't you? Can't have a bad day. Can't have a bad day. All things work together for good. How can you have a bad one? You can't have a bad one. Don't let it. Don't let the devil tell you you can have a bad day. Well, you, you have a right to have a bad day. Look, you've had three, three good ones in a row. Well, let's go for four. Let's go for four. The temple discourse, notice at the very top of your paper, I listed, in case you didn't have a Ryrie Study Bible, I listed the five discourses that were done during this time. I listed them. Notice I bold printed the third one because we're in the third, i.e. my the title of my lesson today, Third Temple Discourse, Chapter 8. And in that Temple Discourse of Chapter 8, he gave us three truly trulys. And listen, this corrupt people... Listen, this is, t listen, who do you think is attending this Bible study? Those, those people that were out to kill him, set him up with all of these, <clears throat> with, with this adulterous woman as a legal trap. 
to get the government to do their dirty work. Cowards. Just absolute cowards. <clears throat> so, when it says the temple discourse of Jesus 2 through 5, I'm talking about the top of your page. The temple discourses 2 through 5 occurs on the last day. Look at verse 37 of the 7th chapter. <clears throat> Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out and said, and look what he said. Look what he said. He said, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, but he spoke this of the Spirit, whom those who would believe in him were to receive. For the Spirit had not yet come because Jesus had not died on the cross, been buried, been raised, and ascended back to the Father and is seated in His glory. That's a pretty powerful message, wouldn't you agree? So we know we got, a great, we got some great sermons coming out of this one because He's now going to explain how all that's going to come to be. He just, listen, nobody had that in the Old Testament. This is going to be based on Jesus Christ dying, being buried, being raised, the gospel, and going back to the Father, see the right hand of God the Father. This is not going to occur until Pentecost. But there's a day coming, you see. When every person believes, the Holy Spirit will take up residence in his body and will flow from his innermost being the rivers of the life of God to other people. Is that true in your life? Should be. Should be. Do you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day? If you believe it, you're saved. If you're saved in the church age, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside your body and his presence there is to become an artesian well of living water of God for the rest of the world to drink like the woman at the well. Jesus is always talking about those who are thirsty. Come. Those who are hungry, come. He's not talking about physical. He's talking about spiritual. Listen, if you get the spiritual taken, he'll take care of the rest. The rest is a piece of pie. Piece of cake. Tell you what I like. For me, it's a piece of pie. For you, it's a piece of cake. Are you with me on this? See, the, imp the importance before we ever get to the truly, truly, the background of this is phenomenal. And this is supposed to be one of the great, joyful, celebrated holidays of the year. Be joyful. Be joyful because of the blessings of God. Oh, I'll be joyful <laughs> when it all is going my way and not God's way. Oh, I'll be joyful. I'll be joyful. Listen. These discourses, five of them, these five discourses establish that the Jewish leaders have no respect for the law and no respect for justice and no respect for the innocence of people. They have none. This is a nation in deep trouble. And it doesn't surprise us that this is a nation that's going to nail their Messiah to a cross and murder him with that intent in their heart. And God is going to flip it on them and save the rest of the world through that act. You can read about that in the John, John the 7th chapter, 45 through 53. The apostate group of people. These were teachers of false doctrine. They spread it out of their synagogues. They spread it out of the t temple. They carried it into the capital of judgment. These are apostate, terrible people. And they deserve to be saved. And they deserve to be saved. Isn't that grace? 
Is that not merciful grace from God? And they deserve to be saved. Jesus Christ is going to die for them. To take them out of that bondage of slavery, a muck and guck, and take them into the kingdom of freedom. As bad as these people are, God wants to save them. God is long-suffering and patient. None perish. None. All these need to. None. How about these guys? None. <laughs> well, if I'd had a gun, no, none. That takes a different heart, doesn't it? I mean, there's a different heart. We got that heart. None. Yeah, but do you know what they just did? Yes, but do you know what they just did? Do you know what they just did? Yeah, of course I know. None. I sent my son to save whosoever believes. That's the only thing that's required. Whosoever believes. It's all required. I don't look at the background, good, bad, ugly. That could have been a Western right there. <laughs> the good, bad, and the ugly. I'm just saying that. If I'd have... If I'd have been in the movie business, I think I'd have done that one. Well, John was right. Is John Dyer here today? He's downstairs. Well, don't tell him. I said to John, I've got a short first hour, and I'll come back to the second hour. John pulled it up and looked at it. He said, nah, I'll put it in a bulletin, but I don't believe you'll make it. He must have the gift of prophecy. <laughs> or he knows me. <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The men will take the offering. Then we'll come back and we'll really get into this thing, having done a little bit of background. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for each person that has come, has sat, been attentive. I mean, you can't better ask for more than that out of a classroom as a teacher. I pray today that we would have a joyful heart, a joyful heart as we give, not by the law, but by the grace of God. We, we have something to be boastful of, even if it's a penny. It's not the amount, it's the heart in the church. It's not about the numbers. It's about the attitude. The humbleness of understanding how God blesses us Maybe even today you could just put a little note in the offertory plate that says, I am so thankful today for how God takes care of me. And you know what? That's an offering we'd all love to read. It's never, it's never all about money. But it is all about attitude. You have a thankful heart today? Don't feel bad that you can't put anything in the plate. Put a note in it that tells your heart how your heart feels about God and what Christ has meant to your life. Just put that in there. Let me tell you, that means more to us than any piece of silver or gold you could put in there. We're thankful for that, Father, because we know you take care of all of this. This is an opportunity for them to open their hearts into blessings. Kind of like at the tabernacle. main thing that God was interested in is bringing a heart that was full of joy for the blessings God had bestowed upon them, no matter what degree. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I did get all the way to two. John, the eighth chapter, part of the temple discourse is really interesting. Especially after, you read, after you've read chapter 7, that sets this whole idea up of the twisted minds of the religious leaders uh, out to get Jesus and uh, do it at a at the Feast of the Tabernacles, of all things. 
Well, point number two, this is the background. Chapter 7 opens the background to where we are in chapter 8. And chapter 8 opens with the background. That's important, to, in, at least in my opinion, of course, is uh, why all that background to me was important so that when he comes out with the truly, truly statements, and he gives three of them, it really has impact. I, I want you to see, what I wanted you to see is not just the history, but what he is going through in dealing with, you know what I'm saying? What, what, what must be going through? I mean, this is the stuff that's been geared towards him. What must he be thinking? What's going through his mind when he's under such assault? You know, it's one thing to have people that don't like you, but want to actually plotting to kill you? I mean, that's a little extreme. Um. And they're willing to do it. And he's just gone through where they've set up a, a whole legal trap to trap him to get the, to get the government to do their dirty work. A divine institution honored by God, they're going to disgrace it this way. All of that is occurring before we ever get to what his attitude is and what he says to the people. So I thought it would be really interesting because we're... We're always involved and engaged in just all kinds of stuff that's occurring in our life, that's got our life all, your life is under assault from so many different directions, and, and God asks you, what kind of a day are you having? You know, because I got a little job for you, um, but I see you going through a bunch of stuff here. I'd like to, I've got an assignment for you, I'd like to give it to you, but I, you know, you've got to have a better attitude. So how you, and that's the kind of th what I thought about when it came time for Jesus to begin teaching. I mean, I've had those days where I fought with my kids and everybody all the way to church. Then I had to go to the pulpit. <laughs> all right? And before I ever got to church, I was thinking about if there was some place I could sell them. <laughs> and how much could I get for them? And now I ah, didn't get nothing for them. Let's go on to church. So, you know, I have that kind of a, a background. So, you know, you, you, you got to, and then you do what God sent you to do. Like, that wasn't what he sent me to do. Well, if I didn't have the kids, I could have really had a good service. Well, he, well that was your ministry too, you dummy. Oh, I just thought there were kids. I, I know, I'm a little slow sometimes getting stuff. but So when I approach Jesus going through the, all this stuff in his life, people trying to kill him, they're trying to do it legally now, they're, all this guy, they, they got contracts out on him. Now they're trying to do it legally, all this stuff. And this is supposed to be the tabernacle time, joyful, joyful, and all of that. And I'm thinking, and then he comes out and he, he delivers this phenomenal message. And I go like, I, I wanted to be able to do that. I want to be able to walk my way through a minefield exploding all around me and have the poise and confidence that God has all of that controlled if I'll take care of what's in front of me. If He'll take care of all the minefield explosions and all the mess around me if I'll just stay focused on what He's got for me to do. And I, and I see that in the life of Christ. And I, I see it for me. You know, it's one thing to see it for somebody else. But the whole thing about the life of Christ is for me. And so uh, this, this background to me was kind of important but before I ever get to the place where I want to tell you what he taught. I want to tell you what kind of a day he was having <laughs> when he brought this great message. I won't get to that great message apparently until next week, but I will get to that message. So this is the background. John 7 leads into John 8, and he's walking through a minefield. A spiritual minefield, okay, and uh, the background eight, which opens with the woman caught, the woman caught in adultery. You know what I find interesting? Um, let me see if I can find it. You know when he showed up at the temple, 
to teach? And who was waiting on him when he got there? Oh, I know. Listen to this. Now, these Pharisees were like bankers. They wouldn't get up until they had to go to work, and they would go to work with an attitude. That's what apostasy does. Always grumbling and griping. These were Jews, you know. Murmuring, gossiping, backbiting, stabbing. You know that is their history, don't you? Well, anyhow. Well, if you haven't read, read Acts the seventh chapter and read about the last ten verses of the chapter, you'll get a good view of what was going on. Well, back to my point. He shows up at the temple. Look at, look at, look at verse one and, two, one and two. Well, let, just look at verse two. Early in the morning, you know, you know what, what you're talking about? Dawn. <laughs> Dawn. I mean, the rooster just crowed. Oh, just crowed. And he, he's at the temple. He got up, brushed his hair and his teeth, and when he walked in the temple, the rooster went, Arr! or however they go. Till I've been away from the farm a while. <laughs> That sounds like dog with sinuses. <laughs> early in the morning is dawn. And early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people were started coming. And he sat down to begin to teach. And the Pharisees were already there with a woman caught in adultery, held her overnight. and are ready to bring charges against him. These bankers wouldn't get up before 9 o'clock for nothing. These are the people who are always late to work. <laughs> How do I know that? Because they're apostate. They take nothing serious that God wants in their life. They're slugs. They didn't show up one day and say, I don't think I'll be a slug today. Early in the morning, dawn, he comes, and they, listen, and the scribes and the Pharisees are already there and present a woman caught in adultery and are ready to bring charges against her and trap him legally so they can kill him. Let the government do it. Why not just let the government do it? We can set them up. We're all in control. It's a sick day, and here's a nation going down, you want a sign of a nation? You want a sign in a nation where that nation that had honorable laws are now dishonoring it? You want to know the nation that's about to fall on their face? This is the nation. I don't care if it's in America or in the Middle East or where it is. This nation right here is about to have it put to them because a nation is a divine institution. And if you're a group of unbelievers and think you can do this, you are wrong. <laughs> We've become the dumbest group of people on the face of the earth, Americans. As soon as we threw God under the bus and his Bible and his son and everybody else, listen, it didn't take a month for our hearts to become insane you think it's going to get better I'll tell you how to get better you get out of the pew and start going out there like I am and telling them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ we bring them back one by one you're not interested in that don't complain about your nation that's going into the toilet You know, we go to talk about people, we complain to people about everything. Never promote Jesus Christ. Bad weather, bad government, bad taxes, bad this, bad that. I'm so sick and tired of hearing about bad without any good news. I made up my mind, I don't like to talk about bad news anymore. I'm a messenger of good news. 
We sit around and go and gripe, gripe about all this stuff and doing nothing about it. I'm not talking about protest. I'm about carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to the highway and the hedges and carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only thing that only thing changed my heart. How about you? Oh, religion did it right. <laughs> Here's what religion does for you. Read seven and eight. <laughs> well, anyhow, I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Where does this trial occur? See, you're forgetting that. You know where this trial occurred? In the treasury of the temple. You know what that is? That's the IRS. This is where they brought their tithe tax. These are the people right there who stole every bit of it from the people. They never honored the tithe. They never honored it. Not one time. That's why this nation is going to go under big time. If this nation is on a short lease. I'm talking about Israel. They, they had such disrespect for God and His word and work. The treasury, the treasury is where the tithe tax was taken and that's where it was distributed, where God told them to take and spend it. <clears throat> There's a first tithe, an annual first tithe. It went to the life of the priest. Because they were part of shadow Christology. The second annual tax went to the temple and the sacrifices. That's shadow Christology. The third tax went every third year, went to the widow, the orphan, and the very poor. These slugs gave none of it that way. They were so disrespectful that a heathen called Herod had to build a temple. Herod should have never, ever had the right to build a temple. But these slugs were willing to have anybody build it but them. They were not going to get it. They didn't give it to the Levites. They didn't give it to the temple. They didn't give it to the sacrifices. They turned the house of God into a place of robbery. Malachi warned him against it. He said, don't rob God. I'm so sick of hearing legalists preach that stuff. It's apostate teaching. Here were the real robbers. These people that are trying to kill Jesus Christ were the robbers of Malachi. They had turned the house of God into a cesspool of evil. They have brought this adultery woman into the temple square, has brought him into the temple, into the treasury area where Jesus was teaching and disgraced it once again. Jesus is going to tell them over and over, you've turned my father's house into a pig's pen. Under the Old Covenant, the treasure area of the temple is discussed in Nehemiah 13, 4 through 14, and Malachi 3.10, and it was about the Jewish tax, tithe tax, that I just described to you. Like in the days of Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 13, this apostate religious Jew were desecrating the temple of the Lord. The temple is nothing more than shadow Christology of the person of Jesus Christ. You can read about this in John, the second chapter. In John, the second chapter, he says, you people must stop making my father's house a place of corrupt business. I mean, what good is the assembly of the church if you don't teach the truth of the word of God? What good is the assembly of God if you don't love one another? What good is the assembly of God if you're not sharing your gifts with one another? What good is the assembly of God if we're not doing the work of the Lord? What possible good reason would we have to assemble if it wasn't for these reasons? How do we know who our poor, uh, who our very poor are? How do we know who our widows are? How do we know who are the children that are being abused? When you're talking about orphans, you're talking about children abuse.
I'll tell you, my heart breaks every year. I mean, I walk away every year, and I have for years and years and years at summer camps with this church. I drive away every year. I can't remember when the last time I didn't drive away from a meeting with young people at a camp that I didn't weep for God. The abuse of our young people is beyond. My heart cannot take much more of this. I mean the church. People are abusing their children to no end. And I say to the Lord, when will it stop, dear God? When will this stop? We are eating our young. We are destroying them. And we seem to not care. We spend our money on our own pleasures and our own goodness and we love our children starve. We've got food programs for children because their parents use their money and don't give it to their children. And out of the goodness of our hearts, we feed their children. They spend their money on themselves. My heart is just broken. And the numbers at camp go up and up and up and up. I can remember a time when 30, when we had 30 and we thought 30 is outrageous. I can remember that day. We're at 70 and 80% now on my watch. I'll tell you what we need to camp for. We need to camp for parents. A boot camp. That's what we need. That's what we need. I go out and talk to these parents. They don't listen. They don't care. They do not care. They would be willing to give me their children. You know what the government do? They put me in jail. Bertel, his heart got broke from people hitting him up for money and everything and truly hungry. He had a friend in the restaurant business. He said to them, I want the food you got left over. I don't mean off the plate. I mean at the end of the day. He went around and collected it and fed the people. His friend said, I think I got friends in the business if you want it. Listen to me. In two years, Bertel fed every hungry person in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the government shut him down. He fed every hungry person in Little Rock. It didn't cost the government one penny. And they shut him down. Think we care about the poor, the starved, the hungry? It just depends on what political party in there, and they're both corrupt. We're the most corrupt nation on the face of the earth today, next to maybe Russia. They ought to be investigating us. Jeez. I know I'm, I, listen, I'm, 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 I'm upset. I'm upset. My wife, she says home praise every day for your children. That little woman sits in her prayer and weeps for her children. Her grandchildren and your children and your grandchildren. And what's happening in America is more than our hearts can stand. And it's not because we're old fogies. You know, you can start orphanages anywhere but America. If you have a heart for children, you can go anywhere. You can go to India. You can go to anywhere in the world. And they will let you feed their children and take care of them except in America. You've got to go through so many hoops and loops and everything else that you can't afford it. We're the most corrupt people. They sit in Washington. They talk about the children. And they talk about this. They talk about that. They do nothing. They take the money and go home with it. They're so corrupt. You send them to Washington. They ain't got a penny in their pocket. They come back. They own half of the county. Figure that out. Bunch of corrupt people. Let me tell you, it's coming. 
It's coming just as sure as this was written in the Bible in Jesus' day. It's a coming. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not pretty now if you pay attention to it. I can tell you stories and I don't have time. Here's the third thing. After Jesus rendered the temple of holies of holies, after Jesus rendered the temples holy of holies for atonement inoperative, oh, listen to me now, from the cross in Matthew 27, 51, you know he did that, don't you? Oh, yes, he did. You know what it says? He rent the veil from top to bottom. Huh? You know what that was? It was the naos. That was where atonement... Listen, the temple is worthless without atonement. The temple, all of everything about the temple was to put Christ on the cross. He's the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. He rendered that thing inoperative and the temple isn't, it, it's worth nothing. Listen, you know why? It wasn't worth nothing when he was here. They were, they were so disrespectful of everything about it. Listen, did God know this hour was coming? Yeah, he already removed the Ark of the Covenant. You know what they should have been looking for? The replacement. What did the Ark of Covenant say it was about? It was about the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. When will the Lord bring the blood of the Lamb? He's here. Now what are they going to do? They're going to kill him out of the blood. He renders it inoperative in the 30s. It's going in the 70s. Right? Kaput. Is not God merciful to give them 40 years? 40 years? <laughs> After they murdered the Son of God, He still gave them 40 years to come on in. Most of us would have carried a pistol. In John 2.21, Jesus said in John 2.21, destroy this temple. In three days I'll raise it again. And they boohooed him. If they know anything about the power of God, if, he, if somebody that had proved that he had the power of God, they would have boohooed him. They went, well, I want to be around to see that. <laughs> I believe he can do that. I'm a, when you have a day, I'm going to take off work. <laughs> I'm taking off work to see that done. I'm going three days, buddy, on sick call. I'm going to see him raise that up. 47 years and building is still not done. <laughs> they booed everything he did. I'll raise the dead. Oh, yeah, I'd have to see that. Oh, there it is. Lazarus, how you doing? Wait a minute. I just was at your funeral a week ago. <laughs> How'd that happen? Who? Oh. <laughs> How many miracles do you need to see to believe? The Jews had tons of them, didn't believe any one of them. You know why? That's not how you get it. You, you don't get sight and then faith. You get faith and then sight. Or you don't get it. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But... It goes on to say, you know, he wasn't speaking of the physical temple. He was talking about his body because now his body had replaced the physical temple. The incarnation of Jesus Christ had replaced the temple for the church. This is why he came. Do you know where that temple is today? Listen to me. you know where that temple is today? Do you know where that temple is today? Right here. It is your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. <laughs> I know, it's crazy, isn't it crazy? You are the temple of God because the blood has made that so. You are the temple of God. Oh, not because you're worthy. Oh, not because you deserve it. Oh, not because you did so much good that God just said, oh, I've got to make him a temple. But he's made you a temple. It's a place where the third member of the Godhead walks around to try to convert the world to Christ.
You live for that? I do. I let my, I let my feet hit the floor and I let my heart hit heaven. And that's the way I want to walk all day long. It's my choice too, you know that? I found that's my choice. I, cho I choose to ride the elevator up, not down. I never, get, I never get lower than the third floor. I push the up button. John 2.22. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered, thank God there's doctrine for you to come back to. Isn't that a wonderful thing? When you confess your sins, boom. Oh, that's it right there. <laughs> oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. When he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered, thank God that they paid attention in class even though they couldn't apply it. They finally got it. It's science. There. I got it. His disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures that was in their soul. Do you love that? Listen, I just keep waiting. The Lord keeps waiting. He planted it. He's watered it. He's hoed it. He's weeded it. Come on! Come on! Come on! Well, here's winter. I'll wait. Spring! Come on! Come on! What do you, why do you think he's planted the Word of God in you? So that it have roots and take and produce in your life. Come on, people. And even though, listen, they on the on the tulies, it was planted, and a day came. Come on, come on, come on! Up there it comes, the word of God producing in your life. This happened in their life. It'll happen in yours. It's a glorious thing, isn't it? It's a glorious thing to see the power of God work in your life and produce things out there that were superhuman. Is that not powerful? I live for that. Don't you live for that? Why would you want to go through this slug world and not have the supernatural working in your life? Gee whiz. I mean, that's my high. Woo! I mean, that's what fires me up. Whether Alabama wins or loses, that will fire. Well. Every church age believer's body is the temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20 is the naos in the Greek language. This was Je what Jesus was trying to tell them in John 7, 37-39 in code. Well, once again, John was right. So I'm going to hold him in honor and I'm going to quit on time. He will like that because he's with the kids. Listen, let me close with this. There should not be an appeal out of this church need to work with children that's not fulfilled immediately. Let me tell you who can be the great ambassadors to children or children. You know how I know? I've seen Cassidy. I've seen Cassidy grow up. She's a phenomenal witness for Jesus Christ. I salute her for that. Young people can hold their stead. They can hold their place. They don't have to be hot when they're 13 for the Lord and go into a cooling system and come back at 30. Daniel proved it. Joseph proved it. And listen, we've got young people in here that are on fire for God and they have no intentions of putting that fire out. And these are the people that are going to rescue that, our generation. We need workers with children. We've got children down there. They should not have to ask you three or four times to put, put senior people down there that can love on these little children. Minister their hearts. Little Ben, what, three? How old is Ben? I know he's going at 30. In, in, in Angie's mind. They were eating in a restaurant the other day 
And this man was over there, and he said to his mother, he's sad, mama. And I said, it's okay. And he tugged her again. You know how you do. We're not going to bother him. He tugs her and goes like, that man is really sad. So she thought she would humor her, and she says, well, Ben, what should we do? He said, we ought to go over there and hug him. Angie said, well, he may not want to be hugged. Oh, he wants to be hugged. I, I, don't, I, I don't think he... Yeah, Ma. Ma! Ma! All right. We can go over, and you can hug him. You ought to maybe tell him why you're going to hug him, though. <laughs> and I'll go with you. Well, I could can, I can go over there by my... No, I'm going to go with you. All right. Listen. You talk about an old man who just melted in a little boy's arms. An old man. Because he walked up to that old man. And the old man said, well, hi, how are you doing? He said, I come to give you a hug. And the old man said, you came to do what? He said, I, I have come to give you a big hug. And the man looked up at Angie, and Angie went like, I, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't put him up to it. And listen, and the old man says, well, okay. And he leans down there, and Angie said, he, he grabbed him by the, around the neck and hugged him. Until the old man relaxed. Isn't that something? And the old man's tears came in his eyes and he thanked him. He looked up to Angie and said, Thank you for letting him do that. Yeah. Why aren't we those people? Why aren't we those people? You say, Well, a little kid could get away with it. I know. Big kid's kid too. May do it a little different. They can too. That's the kind of children we want. We're asking you to come and work with our children to develop that kind of capacity in the heart where they can see needs in other people and have... Listen, he, and he wanted to do it for God. He told his mama, he said, no, he told, I didn't tell you, but he told her, he said, what do, you what do you think? He said, because God wants me to hug him. God wants me to hug him. And he pulled the God card on Nancy and she had to do it. <laughs> but that God card is hard to, hard to battle. Father, we're thankful today for what you've taught us. We're thankful, Father, for the people who are so attentive in this church study with me. I couldn't thank you enough. I am blessed beyond measure. We're in troubling times. My heart is so filled with the troubling times within my nation. I sometimes, like Al said the other day, I just have gotten to a point where I really don't know what to pray for anymore. I pray for myself. That I'd have the boldness and courage to do what little Ben did, reach out there and hug a man that needed to be hugged. Tell him Jesus loves him. Ask him if there's anything we could do for him. Miss Farmer, put that back in my heart. Not only do children need it, but so do the older people need it. She just touched my heart again today with it. We can't neglect either one of these. The baby's coming in and the old one's going out. They both need hugs. They know, both need encouraging. They know, need to have a reminder of the power of God through the Word in their life. And maybe we can learn lessons from little children like Ben. For I made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.